Next up, we have uh, Kate Starbird from the University of Washington, and looking forward to um, doing a successful handoff on the clicker and understanding misinformation in crisis situations. All right, so I have limited time, so I'm going to jump right in um, to talk about online disinformation during crisis events, some research that we've been doing in my lab at the University of Washington. We've actually been studying online rumoring during crisis events, which grew out of a, a research program that was actually initially focused on um, just social media use during crisis events uh, and looking at very positive pro-social things people did after events to help each other and help, uh, and help others. Um, but over time, we also noticed that this online rumoring thing was, was an, an important part of the, the, the uh, information system that, that was manifesting after these events. And so we set off on a, on a research program with colleagues of mine at the, at the iSchool at the University of Washington, and, and we're looking at this. And from, even from our first um, study, we noticed this one weird kind of rumor. And I'm going to talk, talk about this weird kind of rumor today, and you'll, you'll see where this leads us. Um, but this was a tweet that was shared in the early aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing. Boston bombing smells like a CIA black ops false flag setup. Again, don't be fooled by the mainstream media lies. Um, we, we saw this. We saw some other tweets like it. You know, as the, the days went on, the next day, um, this tweet came out with many others that were similar. The truth has been revealed. Boston bombing culprits found as Navy SEALs undercover. So the first tweet was sort of accusing the CIA of being the real culprits of the, of the uh, Boston Marathon bombings. Um, and this tweet sort of has, has evolved to say it was the Navy SEALs. And it points at this website um, called InfoWars in 2013. We didn't know what that was. Those were nice times. Um, and uh, they, they were among a couple of different sites that were driving a lot of this conversation. Um, uh, actually, I used to have another slide there, but it's not there anymore. Um, uh, that was driving a lot of this conversation. And we actually thought initially that this was very marginal. And we studied it. We reported on this as part of um, our, our first study on rumoring around the Boston Marathon bombings. But we went on to study other events and, and, um, and tried to avoid the, that, that conversation a little bit. Um, we knew it was happening. In fact, um, as time went on, my students, we would, we would do this, we did qualitative research. We actually read tweets as well as looked at sort of high-level patterns. Um, my students kept saying, hey, there's another one of these, these false flag rumors or these, this crisis actor rumor um, in, in many of these other events. And I would say, hey, let's, let's not study it. I, I, let's kind of leave that off of what we're looking at. I didn't want to be the kind of person that went around talking about conspiracy theories at conferences. Um, which is um, what I have become, unfortunately. Uh, uh, but over time, we noticed it was it, that, that there, this, was, this rumor was repeating. It, and then through some of the conversations that we were seeing, we could see it was connected back to other, to other, um, to other events as well. And, and though I said that, I, that I initially we didn't want to study it, during the course of 2016, we started to notice some things that were a little bit weird. Um, about intersections between what we thought was really marginal behavior and people that were um, gaining political power in places around the world. Um, having to do with both intersections in the language that was used in some of these places, um, some of the similar kinds of uh, ways of talking about things, connecting to similar narratives, uh, and just the people that were rising in political power started to cite these websites that we thought of as being very marginal and, and not very... Um, and not of influence or not, not, not meaningful. And so I, we changed our mind a little too late um, at the end of 2016 uh, to go back and sort of systematically study some of this behavior and, and, this, um, and this rumoring behavior uh, through what we talked about. We didn't want to use conspiracy theory, so we talked about it as being alternative narratives of crisis events. And so we went back in late 2016 to study um, alternative narratives of specifically shooting events in, during that year. And we use um, kind of a mixed method analysis. We, call, we talk about it as being interpretive um, as opposed to sort of positivist and, um, but, so, and also very dis interpretive descriptive. But we're using both qualitative and quantitative uh, methods. I talk about it sometimes as saying we look at things um, from the 10,000 feet level, and then we go look at the tweet by tweet level, and then we go back to 10,000 feet. So we're going back and forth between um, micro, meso, and, and macro level views of the data. And I'll do a little bit here to, t to show you a little bit about how that worked. 
Um, for this particular study, um, uh, we had actually been collecting Twitter data in real time um, on shooting events. I don't feel good about that. I remember the day we started that collection. It was probably after the San Bernardino shootings, and we just had noticed that, that these shootings were um, really prominent. And so um, we put a, a data collection going in real time on that with all the limitations that Twitter data has, um, but we had shooters shooting gunmen, gunman. Um, over 58 million tweets, uh, that would be very big data. Our methods don't work for that size, so we cut that data set by these terms, false flag, hoax, and crisis actor. And um, these are terms that we recognize were part of the community of talking about crisis events in these ways. And um, the, uh, I used to have to explain what crisis actor meant. I don't think after Parkland, I don't think, I think we have all heard it now, we all, we've all heard this. But we've been seeing that same thing. Crisis, they, they talk about how these events aren't happening, they're being staged by people um, for political reasons uh, of different kinds. Um, false flag is, is similar, they say the event has happened, but um, it's, it was really perpetrated by these folks and they're blaming it on these folks. And these were, were repeated things that we'd heard um, again and again. So we cut it down um, to tweets that just had that and ended up to be about 100,000. I would talk about it as sort of a meso level type of um, activity after hearing Yokai's kind of description this morning. Um, and then um, we did a couple different kinds of analyses. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you a little bit of the content analysis of the tweets just to give you a sense of what the epistemic community of conspiracy theorizing looks like. So here's a tweet that was shared um, within that data set. It comes from a site called Activist Post. Uh, it, it, it frames itself as kind of a trying to appeal to left-leaning people, although some people just call it agiprop. Um, it's got a little white rabbit as its, as its, uh, as its avatar. Ava Activist Post sa says this, was Orlando shooting a false flag, question mark? Shooter has ties to the FBI, regular at club, did not lack of the act alone, question mark. So we had actually noticed before this event um, in some of our data, this language of conspiracy theorizing that they were using. Leading questions, question marks. I'm not telling you what to believe, I'm just gonna give you the facts and you can make up your mind for yourself. And yet giving the, the, the information in this kind of way, also the ability to speculate about things without having to take responsibility for making these claims because they're just putting it in question marks. Um, and so th this, this kind of way of talking was persistent across th these communities. Um, this particular tweet leaks out to the activist post site, which was um, active in this set as well. Here's another one um, by Awakened Mike, another tweet. It links this event um, that was happening. In this case, it was about the Orlando nightclub club shootings, um, very tragic event. Um, and they, they link that back to Sandy Hook and Boston Marathon bomb and claim that there's a gun takeaway agenda. We probably know more about that now. Parkland, the similar kinds of um, conversations have happened. They say these things are being orchestrated in some way because they're trying to take away your guns. And we can see that, that th this, this, these conversations connected back to other events uh, and other kinds of narratives that were sort of persistent. They weren't just one-off things that were happening. And here's another thing that is a pattern across this data as well. Um, and I'm gonna read this one. Orlando shooting was a hoax just like Sandy Hook, Boston bombing, and San Bernardino, keep believing the Rothschild Zionist news companies. So there's a couple things happening here that we began to realize were patterns across these, these um, conversations. And one is this attack on news companies. We've already, already kind of mentioned that above, but the, this is, the, the media is lying to you. Um, but here is also a not very um, well-veiled um, uh, reference to an, uh, an ancient conspiracy theory, ancient, an old conspiracy theory that has been around for a long time that has been used to motivate genocide and violence in the past. Um, and some have pushed back and say, oh, Zionists mean something else, but in this case, the, there's clear sort of dog whistling kind of things happening in these spaces as well. So we started out an analysis of tweets. Actually, we did this kind of in, in juxtaposition at the same time. Um, but So I talked a little bit about the tweets, but one of the things we wanted to do next was actually move beyond just this conversation and these tweets to kind of understanding the ecosystem that was supporting this activity online. And so we, we looked at the tweets and we used them as, as, as seeds to then go out and, and look at the domains, the websites that were active in, in um, publishing this. Oh, I love when the E falls off my thing. That means I've switched to a different version of Keynote. Um, all right. Um, 
so in this case, what we did is we took a, every, this is similar to what Yokai's been doing, same kind of um, uh, practice, except we, we filtered it differently. But for each user that sent two tweets in our set that had links, um, we would connect the, the domain, those domains from those links together. So in this case, wake up, this account has um, sent a tweet to your newswire, and so that becomes a domain in our set. They also sent a, a tweet that linked to activist posts, becomes another domain, and then we connect them with an edge. Um, and so in this, in this set, uh, the more users that did this, the edge go, grows thicker. And so we ended up, and then we also stripped out um, social media for a reason I won't explain here, but everything focuses around them when we can't see the relationships we want to see. So we strip social media out of the graph, and we end up with this, uh, with this graph of, of kind of uh, 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 conspiracy theorizing information space. Um, and then um, we went back and um, to notice the coding there, or so the coloring, we went back and coded each of the websites that were involved in this conversation as a couple of things. Was the content about these alternative narratives actively debunking the alternative narratives of the conspiracy theory? That was the blue, so the mainstream media had actually put out put out uh, articles that said no, um, uh, no, uh, the Orlando Pulse was not a false flag or those were not crisis actors. So they were trying to debunk it. Those in red were actively trying to spread these conspiracy theories or alternative narratives. And those in yellow were actually doing a straight news story and they just got picked up by people who were spreading the alternative narratives and cited as evidence for their, for their, um, for their conspiracy theory. So those, the ones, the yellow sites that are embedded in the red are, are straight, are, are, news sources that conspiracy theorizers, theorizers just go to, they're part of their information diet. So they may be participating in other parts of other similar kinds of conversations. Um, one thing we had here was a big site that was um, actually in, like sucked everything into it and turned out to be bot amplified and a bot would like repeatedly push out uh, content to the real strategy which eventually got picked up by real people who were co-citing with other sites and so we, we stripped that out but I want to note that that was in there. Um, I'm not going to go into the different things here. We see InfoWars was part of it. There's some other interesting sites. I'm going to pull out um, more of the, the, the kind of characteristics of those sites next. So the next thing we did um, was we took those sites and I dove in to do a content analysis. And this is something I'm going to tell you I do not recommend. Um, I spent a uh, winter break a year ago um, doing this and it took me months to recover. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I went through and I did content analysis. Oops, again, I got ahead of myself. I went content analysis of these different domains where I looked at all of the different kinds of things they were talking about. I looked at their about page, their home page, and, and different things. I'm going to pull out a few things from that kind of content analysis. The first thing is there were some of these sites, all of these sites were talking about not just this one thing, they were talking about many, many different kinds of conspiracy theories um, and different ones. So this is a subset, this is not all, but this is a subset that appear, appealed, uh, uh, sorry, appeared not just in one, um, on one domain, but across many of these domains. And, and, and uh, a large portion of them had all of these and more. And you can see a lot of different things going on here. We've got, um, and that appeal to different people. So there's, some of these things appeal to different people. So we've got anti-GMO, anti-vaccine anti stuff um, happening. We've got claims that George Soros is responsible for everything bad in the world. Um, a few folks that also accuse the Koch brothers of similar kinds of things. Um, this obsession with pedophile rings, this was in December 2016 when I did the content analysis, so that intersects with a lot of um, those conversations. Um, and everything up to, to Flat Earth. Um, which I really thought was somebody just experimenting with them uh, to see how absurd they could, you know, what absurd thing they could get people to believe in. Um, and yet that may, that people do believe in it. Um, so there's all this stuff going on. And we start, I start to think about this, um, barring from Sunstein and Vermeule, we're talking about uh, crippled epistemologies. I, I use the term corrupted epistemologies, where um, you start to think about in the world this, in this way and, and you may be able to move from one place to another. And in fact, I've talked to people now who are involved in this space who moved from anti-GMO to anti-vaccines to being 9-11 deniers and then telling me that you know, the Earth, there's just as much evidence that the Earth is flat as it is round, right? And, and, and kind of told me about the path. Um, and there's also possibility that there's, um, there's a gateway happening here where you go on a site looking for one of these things, you're looking for GMO, information about GMOs, and you get exposed to these other kinds of ideas. Another thing we saw here is the connection to some larger narratives that went across some of these things. We're beginning to understand this much better now a, a year later. 
Um, but initially, the thing that I noticed um, was this idea of political left and political right. It just was not what I what, what I went in going to see. I went in thinking about it that way, and the politicized nature of this was always clear to me. Um, but the kind of politicization was happening did not fit into my right left model. And what it had converged around in this space was a strong was, was this term anti globalism, which I didn't even know what it meant at the time. Um, but uh, as, as we begin to un unpack it, um, globalism actually meant different things to different people, and it was used very, very interestingly to draw in people from the left who thought about global, global, globalism as globalization and, to, uh, and the exploitation of, of people and markets by corporations and governments around the world. And then on people on the right, globalism meant um, anti-immigration, sorry, globalism meant uh, open borders, and to be anti-globalist would be anti-immigrant. Um, anti um, and so you can see these things converge around this idea of nationalism in opposition to, to anti-globalism in these spaces. Other kind of narratives that were prominent, um, the US government and other Western governments are untrustworthy and unjustified aggressors in conflicts around the world. And some of these, have, some of these are very appealing um, to, to left-leaning folks and who could see a lot of truth in some of these statements. It was a very strong theme that went across this. Um, these governments and other powerful people manipulate world events to ensure their power, which is you start to get into the conspiracy theorizing pieces. Mainstream corporate media are untrustworthy. They are the fake news. Um, this was really prominent. I had this whole, I had a, having this conversation with a family member in early December 2016. They're like, I finally understand what you mean by this fake news problem. And I said, oh yeah, I was just speaking to Claire's, uh, critiques of it. And so we had this whole conversation. I'm like, dad, oh, sorry, not dad. Um, loved one, you finally, you know, you finally came around. We had this whole conversation. At the end, I realized he was talking about the New York Times and the Washington Post, and I was talking about some of this kind of stuff. So um, they'd already, they had already um, leveraged that term and, and were using it very effectively. Um, they assist governments and other, uh, and other powerful actors. The media assist governments and powerful actors in hiding the truth from people. So you can see how this sort of anti-media starts to fit in to other, some of these other, other topics. One of the things that was most um, sort of disturbing to me at the time was how they so effectively co-opted the idea of critical thinking to draw people into these spaces. So I want to draw your attention to this node 21st century wire was embedded in the right side. They weren't highly um, high volume in the Twitter content for that particular conversation. I would see them again later after I started giving this, them this talk. Um, they actually tweeted at me yesterday. They don't like me. Um, but uh, so here is a web. So th they're in the center of that network. Here is a, uh, their about page, uh, a piece of their about page. And I want to read this one. I, I think it's pretty powerful. The 21st century is the beginning of a new information epic. And you, the reader, are the freshman class of free and critical thinkers in a new and dynamic information age. In its totality, there is an immense volume of information to be had on the internet. But we truly believe that in this new, decentralized, grassroots, and egalitarian World Wide Web, the cream will eventually rise to the top. But this can only be achieved by keeping this internet neutral and free from excessive government and corporate control. I don't know about you, this resonates very strongly with me. I'm, I'm a critical thinker. I believe in a decentralized, grassroots, and egalitarian World Wide Web. I don't want my government in control of, of, my, of my media. Uh, of my, uh, of my uh, internet. Um, Joan gave a, a manifesto this morning that sounded a lot like this, right? So here's, here's 21st Century Wire. Um, they were spreading ideas that, that crisis actors were involved in the Orlando shooting um, to, help, uh, to help hide the truth from us and, and give us a, a false sense of what happened in that event. Um, they actually have all of, these, of this content. Um, you can find everything from aliens uh, saved us from World War III to things about the Illuminati. Um, and uh, initially, when I first did this, they weren't, but they are now selling nutritional supplements as well. So they've come, they, cover the whole, they cover the whole range. Um, and, they, and they use this idea, and they're not the only one. So the other sites, this is a representative of many of the sites. They use that rhetoric of, we're just going to give you the facts. We're going to you know, come here. You're, we're just going to give you the facts. And you can make up your mind for yourself, you, and you'll and you'll be a critical thinker. And yet, the way they lay out the evidence gives very, you know, get, get, encourages this way of unpacking reality and thinking about things, and not trusting media or government or science. Um, another piece of this that I didn't understand at all when I first started doing this was the presence of state-sponsored media. 
RT and Sputnik were embedded in that in the in the conspiracy theorizing part. They were actually in yellow in this conversation, but they'll spread um, other kinds of alternatives and uh, alternative narratives in other cases. Um, Iranian government television, press TV was in there, um, as well as uh, a think tank, a Russian Ukrainian think tank. Um, and then across the wealth of uh, that whole piece of red, when I started doing the other kinds of content analysis, the content was so it was, it was all English, because we used English terms at the, at the bottom, and, and many of these were, were US-based shootings that we, we went in through. So we're going through their English-based content, and it's so pro-Russian, pro-Putin's Russian, um, and, and pro-Putin's Russia, and, and all of these things, um, that it, that was just persistent across all of these different sites, as to, as to make you think that they were sharing content for some reason which they are, and I don't know the reason. Um, so we had this, this, this I, I knew it was there and I didn't really know why. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanna show you, we've, we're gonna step away from that particular piece of the conversation to talk about some more recent research and, and some other kinds of things. So since doing that one, we took that same network property and have looked at a couple other kinds of um, events and we've done some other kinds uh, of things. So I've, I've showed you this one. But we notice that many of these same sites in that red um, actually appear in when we look at um, conversations around the white helmets in Syria. And this is right now, there's a, a large group of people that are very anti-white helmets and they've got some very good criticisms. They're so good and I've been doing research in here, I've been affected by them so strongly that I have a hard time saying that the white helmets are a humanitarian response organization in, in Syria. Um, the, the folks in, in red are actually supportive of the, of the white helmets, very sympathetic to their cause, and the ones in blue are not. Um, and, and I can only tell you that th when I posted this picture on Twitter, they, the folks in blue really didn't like the, photo, the picture, and they got really mad at me. So I, but I, don't, I haven't said much more about what's going on in that space. I'm gonna give you a little hint here. Um, but some of the same kinds of sites, 21st Century Wire's there, but some of the other same sites are in there as well. Um, we also saw some of these same sites, once we knew that they were there, the, the, the ecosystem around the MH17, when the airliner was shot down over um, Ukraine, a lot of the same sites uh, appear in that conversation connected to each other as well. So they're part of this, um, this effort to confuse that space uh, afterwards. And so um, we'd done this research, I just started to poke at this, I didn't know what we'd had, and I started to circulate this around. Um, and someone says, you know, you really need to read Peter and um, Michael Weiss's paper, um, The Menace of Unreality. Um, and when I went into this space, I really thought disinformation meant um, just purposeful, purposeful misinformation. I thought that was the definition. But um, Peter gave me a different definition that I found really useful. And that the purpose of disinformation is not to convince. The purpose of disinformation is to confuse, to create muddled thinking across society with the idea that a society that doesn't know where it can go to, for information it can trust is one that is easily manipulated. And you can start to see that, that, that effort to confuse through the, the kinds of language that they're using, the kinds of different theories that go together and the different ways of, 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 of picking at things and, and, and teaching people to oh, use critical thinking to unpack everything and not believe what you're being told, not believe your own eyes um, and you could see that kind of strategy at work in this space. And I want to read um, probably, oh, I left my phone, so I can't read it. Uh, I was going to talk about one last thing. So one of my students was doing this research um, with me, uh, talked about um, what it meant to try to do the research around um, the MH17. We actually tried to do research in the time before we knew what disinformation was or how it worked. We tried to do research around um, that event. And he ended up describing it as, um, it was, an, it was so hard for us to make sense of what was going on. And it felt like someone was just pumping static at you all the time. Um, or you were like listening to a radio of static and it's taped to the side of your head is how he described it. Because it was so disorienting to try to make sense of what was going on. Our methods broke. Our methods for understanding rumoring broke when we tried to look at MH17. The same kind of thing has happened when we've looked at um, the, Syria, the Syria conflict is we've gone in and we've tried to make sense of things and it's so disoriented, especially for a left-leaning person and that content is actually 
focus on left-leaning people. Um, it's, it, it starts with anti-imperialism, and it starts with some good, very good critiques of why the U.S. got into the Iraq War, and 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 pushes those to 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 push some of these other kinds of ideas. And it's so disorienting. It's so powerful um, that. Um, that it's hard for us to come back up. So we, you know, we, it, it, it's it's hard. It, it, it's it's very effective. They're very good at what they do. Um, do I have to end at zero? Or do I have five more minutes on this? Do you know? Um, keep keep talking. I've got a couple You're more slides. That want, there's a couple more things that they do that are effective. Okay. Um, so one of the things that they that we've noticed around specifically the, the Syria space is that they um, have they leverage activist communities different kinds of activist communities to pull them in to these kinds of conversations. So in this particular conversation in the blue, they've actually um, taken what was uh, pro-Palestinian activists and they've split them and they've taken a portion of those that were, that were um, supporting Palestine in that conflict and they've, bec they've started to become Assad supporters in Syria. And they've, they've leveraged a couple of these narratives, anti-imperialism and, and anti-Western intervention and then use that to pull people into this new set, set of conversation um, and, and new ways of thinking about things. Another thing they do, um, which is very effective, is they remix and repackage information in different ways. So we noticed when I first was doing this research that I would often see the same article in different, exact same article in different places. Um, at first I thought, oh, all these different sites are saying the same thing, and then I realized they were saying the exact same thing. Um, and what happens is they have these content, content sharing um, practices. And this graph we've been working on is not a perfect way to represent it. But what we've done here is actually take articles that appear um, in 85% similarity in two different sites, and we use that to connect, to, to connect the graph. Um, and so from the high level, and this is from um, the White Helmets conversation from last summer. Uh, and so we've been experimenting with how to best represent this. Um, but when we, we start to see these patterns, if you dive in closely, you'll actually see a lot of very different kinds of media that are targeted at different people that are publishing the exact same thing. So we've got the libertarian folks, we've got Lee, Lou Rockwell, um, we've got some academics in here, Tim Hayward. We've also got some survivalists, conspiratorialists, true patriots up at the other side, um, some, some pro-Russian sites, um, uh, sort of left-leaning veterans, to left-leaning sort of veterans today. Um, left being an, an interesting way to describe that. But what they've done, and then Jew World Order in the middle that just repurposes all this content and puts it back out. Um, what we've got are, are, are this way of, we've got this fragmented community, and so they repackage these things for, for people in different communities uh, in ways that can pull them into these same common narratives. So that's how we get these things that don't necessarily seem to go together, but they're being pulled um, into these same narratives very cheaply by literally reusing the same content. They're not, even, they're not even reframing it. They're just putting it in a different website, a different package. And my, uh, my last thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end it, is I think this is a big question for those of us who've been in this space, and, and, um, and it's a really hard one, is to think about you know, the properties of emergence of all these different people that are working for different motivations. Um, versus orchestration, and um, yes, I said that there's uh, governments involved in this space, but it's not all one puppet of, of Russian spies moving this kind of thing. So these, these big questions of all these different kinds of people with different kinds of motivations per participating, and I've really tried to stress, this is a complex system, it is not somebody pulling the strings, and there's actually people that are in there for all sorts of different reasons, um, and we don't know what happens when we take out the Russian bots or the, or the trolls or whatever, um, I, I don't think the system stops. I think it might look a little different, um, but there's a lot of different things going on there. And I'll end there, yeah. No, Kate, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. Let's get a, a round of applause there. I, I know that you've, uh, you've made Yohai methodologically very happy because I can see at least two ideas that he's stealing from you in his next paper. <laughs> um, before we just take one or two questions, uh, let me just be clear. Uh, we're talking only about this work or can we talk about your WNBA career as well? We cannot talk about my WNBA It's two different people. It's like I've split and I okay. do Okay, all different right, places. all right. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll stay purely on media. We're not gonna talk at all about, uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Yun Kang Yang. I'm also from University of Washington. Uh, I have two very brief questions. The first one is a methodological one. Uh, wh what methods did you use to, to establish that uh, the 85% of similarity in content across different media outlets? I think that, that is a very interesting method to me. And the second is there seems to be a political intention uh, 
behind these uh, uh, different types of media outlets. You, out, you, you said something about the state-sponsored actors, and there are also some US-based conspiracy websites. Uh, so do you think there is a political coordination uh, between state-sponsored actors and US-based conspiracy uh, uh, websites? If there is, how would you establish that? And what kind of political uh, coordination is that? Yeah, I, this is, that is, I think it's a million dollar, million dollar question right now. Um, I, uh, yes, I, we do know that some of their, there is some coordination. For sites like Veterans Today, um, we've gone back uh, very specifically, it was a big site in my first graph, which is why, and I'm, a, and I'm an army brat, which is one of the reasons that I, that I looked deeply at that site initially. And it turns out in 2015, they developed a relationship with the NEO, which is the New Eastern Outlook, which is a think tank in Moscow. And so they actually have a, a content sharing, or some kind of relationship. We can't see exactly what it is, whether it's paid or whatever, but they have an article about how they developed a partnership with them. So there are, and that's, that's, a, that's one case. Uh, we, but, but to map each of those out and to know what they mean and how much, it, it, we don't know. We don't know the extent of, of how much of this is emergent, people that are doing it just to sell the nutritional supplements versus people that are ideological believers versus people that are doing it for political reasons or outfits. And it's really hard, and some of them are, are all three at once, so it's hard to distinguish. And the methods question, um, we can talk off, offline on that. Um, we, uh, it's, it, we took the articles that were posted from Twitter, we unwound them, and we did a, a comparison metric. Um, and I'll have to, we, what I did was I stole a great undergraduate from the computer science department, and she's been working with me, and so I'll have to, uh, and we haven't written it up yet, so I don't, I, don't, I don't have the exact answer, but I can get it for you. I'm gonna go over here to the front here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Harsh Taneja at the University of Illinois. So, I mean, this is fascinating, but I, whenever I look at these studies that try to map the content ecosystem or the social media sort of, you know, sharing of this content, I begin to wonder about what is the volume of exposure that this content gets and where I'm coming from is including my own study recently with Jake Nelson, maybe Andy Guess at Princeton and Genskow at Shapiro. I know of only three of us using very different data sources that have tried to estimate the net exposure to these sites. And we find surprisingly small levels of exposure and the mechanisms are that these are really a very small segment of, if I may use the word, loonies of some sort who make their time to go here. So would you have some yeah. sense of yeah, no, I, I think that's a good question and I think that's a good answer to that. And I, and I agree, I, when we first started seeing this stuff, we were, who, what impact does it have, who, who cares and whatever. And it wasn't until we started seeing people in power citing these sites, people in power echoing these narratives, people in power either um, ideologically believing this or starting to use this as a tool, um, when that fake news and that way of talking with those question marks starts coming out of Donald Trump, that's when you s we start saying there's a, con there's a connection here. And he starts actually echoing, pointing to some of these sites, re repurposing those memes. And so, um, so I don't know how to, I don't know how to measure these particular sites. I just know that those particular sites or the people in those particular sites r are starting to reflect things that people in political power are saying. And that's when it became meaningful enough for us to do the research. But initially I was like, how many people, our numbers are low. How many people could this could affect? Um, and yet, after the Las Vegas shootings, your Newswire, which is one of our little red sites, was the most was the top Google search for a while for people looking for information about the Las the Las Vegas shootings. Um, and they were claiming it was the New World Order. It appeared. One of my friends posted in her in her Facebook feed. So so yes and no. Yes, I think when we measure it, it looks low. But when we think about it in other ways, I think it's having an impact. I wish it wa wasn't, and I would be happy not to be standing here anymore. Um, if, if you could tell me it doesn't matter, I will go home. I'm ha I'd be happy. So, Kate, thank you so much.